Good evening and welcome to Gwinnett County Public Libraries Meet the Author series. I'm Denise Ozier. I'm in charge of adult services for the library system. And tonight's author is John Searles. John is the best-selling author of the novels Her Last Affair, Help for the Haunted, Strange But True, and The Boy Still Missing. He is with us tonight, however, to talk about Her Last Affair. He has won the Boston Globe Best Crime Novel of the Year and the American Library Association's Alex Award. His books have been on Entertainment Weekly's top 10 must-read list. And Strange But True, this book right here, is now streaming on Netflix and Amazon Prime. John has appeared regularly on morning programs like NBC's Today Show, CBS This Morning, Live with Regis and Kelly, NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and CNN, just to name a few. In addition, his essays, book, and restaurant reviews have been published in the New York Times, the Washington uh, Post, and numerous other magazines, newspapers, and websites. Welcome, John. Tell us about this book. Hi, Denise. Thank you for that warm welcome. I really appreciate it. And I do have to say, I have a special guest with me, if I could show her for a second. Hold on. There Hi. she is. Hi, everybody. That's Ruby. So I just want to warn everyone in advance. I told Denise this before we started that at some point, my husband might come home and she might start barking. Forgive me. There's nothing I can do. I tried to stop it. It just happens. And when he comes through the door, he drops to his knees, throws off his coat, and they have a little love fest in the hallway. So, so that's just what happens. But I've warned him that I'm sitting in the living room uh, in, our, in our apartment in New York City, and I'm, I'm doing this great chat. Uh, and it's nice to see you, Denise. Thank you. Um, so tell me your first question. Okay. What's her last affair about? Well, first off, just, just give them, I've read the book, but give them a little bit of a taste of what this story is about. Her last affair is, there it is behind me, um, is a story about love and about lost loves. And the way the book is structured, it's three seemingly separate characters, uh, and three seemingly separate storylines that halfway through the book converge. So part of it, the fun of it for the reader, what I wanted, it was a puzzle piece of how did these three stories connect? And then when they do, I wanted there to be some real Ah. Is for the reader like oh my goodness this I can't believe what's happening now uh it's you know it gets my books get categorized as thrillers I don't really think of it as a thriller I think of it part thriller part character study um part homage to film noir so it's a yes. different thing it's set and the reason I say film noir is set I don't know if you can see there on the cover there's an abandoned it's an a set an abandoned or a defunct drive-in movie theater and the main character, the narrator, is a woman named Skyla Hull, who ran the drive-in theater in upstate New York for nearly 50 years with her husband. And a few nights before their golden anniversary, he dies in a freak accident uh, out in the woods behind the drive-in. And so we meet her a year later where she takes in a very charming uh, tenant in, this, in the matching cottage on her property that it's kind of the, the driving movie screens all tattered and it's kind of looming above those. Mm. Kind of, and when she takes in this tenant, it begins a very strange and circuitous story. I, I say, I was doing an interview with Jodi Picoult and I said, what's well, a love story? She said, it's not a love story. I said, well, it's a story about love. I would say that it's a story about love that gets kind of dark and twisted and strange. So you have Skyla Hull, who's the narrator. And then a thousand miles away, you have a woman named Linnell who's in, about to turn 50, she's in a, just a kind of marriage that has run its course. She's just been kind of quote, canceled for an innocent, seemingly innocent to her at the time, photo from her youth that surfaced on the internet. So she was fired from her job as a high school art teacher. And one morning on Facebook, she gets a message from her very first love, uh, a man named Teddy. And it says, I've never stopped thinking about you all these years. And Morally, she does not want to engage in, a, in an affair, but yet it's her only source of excitement after all these years. And yeah. so they begin chatting and one thing leads to another. It gets a little sexual at times. And my mother, when she saw the excerpt of the magazine, she said, is this Fifty Shades of Grey? <laughs> That's a little sexy, but it's more a play on Linnell's awkwardness because in this day and age, people get you know, very sexual on 
computers and things like that. And she's on, she's a 50 year old woman and she's like reconnecting with this man she once loved. So she, flirtation is, she's rusty at flirting and she's not like up to date with the mores of, the, of flirtation now online. And then you have another character, Jeremy, who is a disgruntled writer who's very self-conscious about his appearance. And he he really, really <laughs> wants to get back together with this uh, ex -girl, recent ex-girlfriend of his. And she has to go away to a funeral. So she asks him to watch her very overquaffed show poodle. And he agrees and hopes he'll win her back. And But he gets an assignment to go uh, back to Providence, Rhode Island, where he once lived and where his very, the very first love of his life broke his heart. And so off he goes with this show poodle and all these instructions on how to take care of the <laughs> poodle. And while there, he works up the courage to look up his very first love and ask her to go to dinner. And so it's really a book about people grappling with lost love and reconnecting with love and, 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 and that's the book. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, well, I want to start to talk about the cover art. I, um, I would have bought this book, even if it hadn't been given to me. It's, it's, an, it's an ARC, everyone. It's an advanced copy. So this is not a finished copy, but I fell in love with the cover. It uh -huh. is the movie, the movie uh, theater that, he, that, he, that John talked about. Um, and I, I got to tell you, John, I went a little cray cray and I Googled because, of course, I is from from my youth. Um, I Googled all of them that are left in the United States and I found that picture. You did it, the arc. I did. I really did. Yeah, that's how great I there's, if there's mountains. Um, I cannot remember the name of it, but this has obviously been uh, cut quite a bit because the actual one, because of that design you can see in the, the the panels that are missing I could find it exactly and there's mountains behind it so that it's not the white background and there's no little houses next to it but I thought I got it <laughs> so I just love that and I think a lot of us of a certain age have great remember uh, great memories of a drive-in what made you include the drive-in kind of as a character yeah, the, the location in this book is very much, the setting is very much a character because right from the start, you meet Skyland. She talks about the noise of the asbestos panels rattling in the wind Ooh. of the old drive-in movie theater outside of right above her cottage. And so it has a very haunted feeling. But uh, I, whenever I go home to see my mom, I pass an old drive-in movie theater. It's called the Rocky Point Drive-In and no one probably notices it but me, I see the sign on the side of the road and there's a chain across the driveway, the sign covered by trees. And you can kind of just still see the remains of it out in the woods. And I'm always driving, staring at it and just wondering about it. So one day, I've, this has gone on for years, my obsession with it. And so Thomas, my husband, when we're driving, <laughs> okay, there's your drive-in, there's your drive-in. And um, I looked up, I just Googled and looked up what it used to be in its heyday and it was a really popular place wow. and mobbed all the time and then it went through a decline and now it's just shuttered and abandoned and I always joke I said then it, well then I started googling and I found hundreds of images of abandoned drive-ins all across America forgotten by time I actually made this great video that's on my social media account on my Instagram which is at John Searles or on, on my Facebook author page which has all these images of, that I discovered online and forgotten drive-ins. And I just found them so haunting and evocative. Yes. And I thought, what a great setting for a novel. And then I always joke, and I realized Stephen King hadn't used it yet. So I better hurry up and do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. Too bad. Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah. yeah. So it was just a great setting. And then as part of the, part of the structuring of the novel, like I said, it's, fun for the reader, I hope it's fun, is that there are three seemingly separate storylines that each has their own plot and momentum, but the yes. question, how do they connect? And then halfway through they do. But I realized at a certain point writing the book, Denise, that I needed to create a sense of cohesion for the reader or some kind of hint or, or nod to the fact like, tr trust me, like a subliminal message that trust me, this is all part of one thing. And I thought, well, what- This still makes sense, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I thought, what if I start each chapter with a quote from a film that once played at the drive-in? And then I thought, what if the quotes acted as 
hints or clues about what is about to happen in the chapter and the mystery of the book. And so that was really fun because then it gave it a cohesion and a structure. And some of the quotes are classics like Casablanca, which opens the book. And then some are more sinister, yes. like Go and The Shining. And then some are these, you know, kind of 80s fluff like Mannequin or Cannonball Run. And I had so much fun finding these quotes and using that as a kind of a, to create a sense of cohesion for the reader. And so many readers have written to me and said how much they loved that element because they, after a few chapters, they realized, oh, wait a minute, these are like little clues. And they just had a great time. Uh, absolutely. And I get to tell you, uh, there's, I happen to know for a fact, there's 19 chapters in this book and 19 quotes because I wanted to go through and I love old movies and uh, I was tickled that only two of them had I, did I not, would I not have recognized um, or did there were only two that I did not recognize because I used to stay up at night and watch old movies. Uh, my parents had no idea I was doing that, you know, until two or three o'clock in the morning. So I, I adored that. That was really fun, John. Oh, I'm so glad. Do you remember the two that you didn't know? Do you remember what they were? Uh, yeah, and, uh, it was. It might have even been the very last one. Um, brief, brief encounter. Okay. I did. Not, I did not know that one. And then there was one other, but it, I, I told myself it was okay because it was one of those movies a girl would not normally watch. <laughs> you know, it was kind of a guy car thing, and I was like, that's uh, okay. Maybe I yeah, better watch. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was the fun. Could thing. be. Uh, some of them were like real classics, like Mildred Pierce or things like that, or Roman Holiday. Oh. And others were just not, And because you, you think at a drive-in, they would show Creature of the Black Lagoon, which has a quote. Or Definitely. You know, they would show movies like that. So it was a real mix of movies. And, you know, as I said about noir movies and noir fiction, I once heard the writer Dennis Lehane say this funny thing, or I read it, and where it was like, he was asked, how do you define noir fiction? And he said, basically, it's scuzzy people doing scuzzy things to each other. <laughs> and I laugh. <laughs> you know, there, this is meant to be an element of noir here, too, where these are kind of, listen, if you're looking for a happy-go-lucky romantic read, I suggest you no. go read Noir Robert no. or something like that <laughs> and have fun. Yes. This is, yes. you know, these are like, dark twisted characters. I, I re did an interview yeah. with New, Newsday recently and the reporter said, that gave me, paid me the biggest compliment. He said, you know, it reminds me of a Coen Brothers film in the tone like Fargo or something like that. And that would oh. such a to me because Fargo, I think is such a great movie because those characters are so strange. You have the pregnant yes. played by Francis McDormand. You have this guy yes. who's a criminal, it's funny, but then it gets kind of twisted and violent and sad and poignant, but then it's kind of darkly humorous. And this book, I hope, to, I like to think, and I've heard from people that there is a lot of dark humor to it. And it's fun too. It's oh, great. tons. Yeah. <laughs> tons, tons, tons. And the other thing I wanted to comment about uh, with the, the movie quotes, well, of course they tie back to our cover. So I love that aspect. The other thing I picked up on John, was, and I didn't catch this right away, but I did about middle through the book. Oh, these quotes all foreshadow what John's gonna tell us in this chapter. So everybody like the first quote is from Casablanca. Uh, but this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Um, I'm sure I didn't say that quite exactly right, but, but that is in fact where Skylar first meets Teddy. Yes. So it was the beginning a friendship. And I noticed that it went on and on. Like you were very clever and careful how you picked those. Don't minimize uh, how clever that was for, for, for tying all of it together. I, I definitely noticed that and loved it. Perfect. Loved it. Because it was so much fun to do. And like I said, I wanted the book to feel like a puzzle piece for the reader. You know, you have to do some thinking, like how are these connected? We, what is you this, do. What's this quote telling me? And also when you get to a, quam, a quote like uh, red rum, red rum from The Shining. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You think, oh, oh no. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you definitely do. You definitely do. And with Skylar, you, you know, I, I just that that is my favorite character in the book because, uh, well, for, for lots of reasons. But but yeah, red rum, red rum. You know, I just didn't know. Did she did she, you know. Uh, Who's she going to kill with that? We got to tell them a little bit about Skylar. Please, please tell them about 
Skylar in her uniform and her, little, her toys. In her. Yeah, Skylar is, um, as I said, the woman who ran the drive-in with her husband for nearly 50 years. We meet her a year after his death. He died a few nights before their 50th anniversary. And she's heartbroken. Her only company is Siri. And so there was a lot of fun <laughs> with her asking Siri for help. And Siri, as happens in my life, misunderstands everything I say. <laughs> so she's gonna argue. <laughs> so, you know, I, there's something about, she was a nurse for her whole career and she still wears her nurse uniform for the authority and confidence it her and for the ease. Yes. And she keeps sources of comfort in her pockets. Yes. Um, a monkey faced finger puppet, a book of matches from her honeymoon, uh, her re creased retirement letter, her wedding bands. And then we kind of come to find out pretty quickly in the book that she also carries around a, a loaded syringe uh, right. in her pocket and some, and some pills. And part of it, you know, these, the, there's something about the character of a nurse like Annie Wilkes, speaking of Stephen King from Misery. Yes. Or, oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Her, her nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's uh -huh. Nest. The nurses are there to do good and to help people. But there's something about a nurse when she's kind of twisted the other way. <laughs> so scary. So yeah. Skyla is creepy and scary. And People Magazine, I was so honored they called the book Delight, Wonderfully Creepy or Delightfully Creepy, something mm -hmm. like that because I wanted it to be creepy, but not off-putting to where you don't want to read it, but kind of fun, creepy. And it is. I wanted also, she's a, you know, tough as nails in a lot of ways, but I wanted hopefully by the end of the book for the reader, you know, to really feel for her when they learn her entire story and what happened with her yes. life, what happened with her marriage and how she hoped for one last love and friendship with this renter she took in named Teddy. And so, you know, in the ways like a great book like Olive Kidridge, which I love that collection of stories, it's a novel. Um, that character is kind of acerbic and hard to love, but then you come to oh, love yes. her. So my hope would be that the reader would feel that way too. At first you think, wow, she's this is a tough woman who's not always the most likable. <laughs> and right. you feel really, you feel really sympathetic toward her, um, I hope. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I think what's cool about the character and probably why she's my favorite is because she change, she changes how I feel about her from the very beginning. You, you know, when I first introduced her, I'm thinking, oh God, you know, she's like a clown, you know, she's the nurse, you know, how clowns can be terribly frightening. Um, if they're that, that uh, strange connotation that we have of clowns and she might be that kind of nurse, you know, as you said, Annie Wilkes, um, so I just didn't know what to make of her. Is this woman, uh, you know, I know she's insane in some kind of ways, um, but she surprises me. She surprises me in the end. I'm glad. Some really kind of fun, there were some scenes that were really fun to write with her, like when she invites Teddy over to her cottage and I don't know, just some of their conversations and their back and forth. Dancing, <laughs> the dancing. I mean, I'm picturing this blind elderly woman, <laughs> nearly yeah. blind elderly woman dancing with this young man. And, and it just was like, there was also that ooh factor. Ew. <laughs> I know. But I forgave her for it. <laughs> when it all, it all kind of made, made sense, you know, at, at some point. But yeah, she, she was lovely. She, she really surprised me. Um, I also wanted to talk about my second favorite character, which was Siri. <laughs> oh, Siri. Yeah. Oh, you were brilliant. You were brilliant. And I can't think of a single book, John, where, um, where, where I felt like Siri was a character and, and I, and I just loved it. There's, there's a whole bunch of videos out on YouTube about old people communicating with Siri. They're, they're absolutely hysterical. There's actually some videos about, seniors how um it actually is a lifesaver for them because it's somebody to talk to and this woman is so lovely. Oh, dad's home yeah here he comes <laughs> dad's uh, home. welcome home <laughs> yeah. hi dad we're about to just have a big love session so <laughs> of course they are yeah, she's but um, she's running around and anyway but um yes so, fun. you know my, um my father-in-law um it's from Rome, he's Italian. And one day I was at their home and I was upstairs writing and I heard him 
talking to Siri and he has a, a beautiful <gasps> Italian accent and he said, oh. I can't, I'm not, forgive me for trying to imitate his beautiful accent. I don't, it's like, Siri, would you be so kind as to call my son? And Siri was like, what? And like, <laughs> if he was like being so polite with Siri. And I thought it was just so interesting. And then I think of all the gaffes I have with Siri. Anytime I ask her something, she, it's always, she misunderstands me and I get frustrated. So I don't actually use Siri that much anymore, but I, and there's a function where you can also have Siri read whatever's on your screen. I didn't realize that, but it's like, then you have this wow. like, here. And so whatever's on your screen she'll read to, which I discovered while writing the book. So certain people like Skyla would have that function on her phone. So then if she called up an article or something, she could press that button. Like if Siri called up something for her. So it was fun to write. I had even more Siri misunderstandings and my editor was like, I think we need to tone this down. <laughs> Because I had so much, but my editor is a very wise woman, and she just said, "I think we'll keep Stop, it huh? a certain level." Yeah. So that's yeah. Funny. But John, this would make a very funny news, uh, a magazine article um, about how, in point of fact, Siri does can be a lifeline, like you talked about for seniors, but but it does fill a, a loneliness, and uh, I mean that's when I started to care about Skyler when I realized, you know, even though she called her Little Miss Know It All and Metalhead, and you had all kinds of great <laughs> names yeah. for Siri, but I realized this is a lonely, vulnerable senior, and this is this is a lifeline. This is a voice that she hears. So as funny as it was, it, as, as it was she. It's a necessity, and but then the reason she ends up placing an ad for a tenant is because she wants to know this kind of eyes and she says not some malcontent on the payroll or <laughs> that whatever she calls Siri yes. ad or something. She's like, but a living, breathing human. And she's definitely first meter, she's kind of rejecting all the tenants because she says what it's hard to describe what I what I want in a tenant. And then along comes Teddy and he's this charming British man and she says something like, you know, it's like love it was like love, sometimes you just know. And she doesn't feel something about this man and she just wants to have him there for company. Yes, she yes. Gets attached to him. Um, and so, no, yes. story, yeah. No, and it, it uh, you, you um, I went off on the wrong track, which was which also makes a book great because you think you've got it figured it out and then, then you're wrong. And I, I, you know, when when he came into the picture, I thought, oh, here we go, vulnerable senior, Guy comes, rents the apartment, takes advantage of her. She changes her will. You know, we hear this all the time. This, this stuff happens. Yeah, it does. That's where you were going um, with that character. Um, and so I you can see that's well, there's a the misdirection when you're writing is fun because you you think, okay, what will the reader think at this point? And you don't ever really know for certain, but you know, then I have people read it, my editor, my agent, Thomas, friends, trusted readers. And so I get their reactions to it. Um, and that's always fun to play with the misdirection and surprise readers, you know, and I've done that with all my books, Strange But True, Help for the Haunted, where you think it's going one way and then it twists another way. And that's, that always feels so good when a reader says like, oh my gosh, you fooled me. And it makes me really happy. Yeah. You, know? you totally did. You totally did. You fooled me at the end too. And I, I won't give that away, but there was lots you fooled me with. And I loved the book so much. I, everyone, I went out and bought, whoops, um, uh, all of his books. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. Thank you. But yes, I did. I have another one coming. The only one I'm missing is oh, on haunted too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I oh yes. I am. I'm very excited about it. Uh, I was so glad that, that I discovered you. Um, the other thing I love about your writing, which I think is really quite unique, is yes, it's a mystery. Yes, it's a thriller. But, you know, you you could just plain old write comedy, John. <laughs> you could. And, um, you know, I was hysterical when you gave me a glimpse of, of what it's like to be a character, work as a character at Disney. Where did you, you know, how did that, how do you know about that? The, the, it, one fun thing about the book is, you know, Skyla, when she was in, uh, this is a, I'm going to come back to your question, but a way of answering sure, it. Sure, yes, take your time. Skyla says at one point, um, 
you know, she read romance novels when she was a nurse and working oh, in ships yes. and her patients yes. sleep. And then the Linnell character, when she meets her, asks, well, what, what do you think makes good love story? Because she's looking around her cottage filled with all these love stories. And she says, well, in my opinion, the couple needs a unique how we met story. And then uh, a million obstacles that make it seem as though they're never going to be together. And then at the last minute in an unexpected twist, like a bit of magic, they end up together after all. And yes. so I wanted each couple in the story to have a unique how we met story. So Skyla met her husband and we see the scene at the end of the book in the projection room one night when she was a young girl, Skyla would pedal there on a Saturday night. She didn't have money to watch the show, but she would watch it from the edge of the field and look up at the screen and make up the stories in her head because she couldn't hear it because she's watching. And then she gets caught by the man who owns the private. <laughs> and he says, you're gonna work off. You've been doing this for months and you're gonna work it off. And he drags her into the projection room to work it. And she meets the man's son and the son becomes her husband and they're married for 50 years. And then at the end of the book, she's watching a movie sitting watching a movie and she can hear it, but she can't see it. So it's completely flipped. Mm -hmm. But then, so she has a unique how we met. Story. Jeremy met his first love, Marianne, at a retail rental warehouse. And their job was to wash manne mannequins that <laughs> back from the, the department store. So wash them and clean them up. So they had a really unique how we met story. And then Linnell, who I, I've talked about, she met her husband, her first love rather, working at Disney. And so she right. was a princess. And he was a pirate. And, you know, for years I was a magazine editor at Cosmopolitan Magazine, and we did stories on young women who worked at Disney. And Thomas, my husband's a theater director, mm -hmm. and a number of his friends worked at Hershey Park in various capacities. So <gasps> oh, we did these funny stories about working at amusement parks and read these stories. And so I don't know, I just had the idea, like what if they met working at Disney? And I have to tell you, Denise, that chapter was originally three times as long. Again, my editor, oh. like, been a novella. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. it's hilarious, but you it need is. to it down. So and that in and of itself is, is again, not like a traditional thriller because there's a lot of humor in that chapter. Yes. And again, I don't think of my books as thrillers in that way. I think of them just as stories. And I don't think of myself as a thriller writer, I'm just like, a writer and so I had fun creating that world Linnell doesn't want to go work at Disney her mother forces her <laughs> mother yes. job her mother has like a very small disability because she hurt her elbow which I have a friend who did this when he was a kid and she, he can't bend his elbow fully but she uses that to get um fast tracked onto all the rides so she rents herself out which I read these stories too, to families who don't want to wait in line at Disney. And because she's there, she says to Linnell, you're going to audition for a princess. You're young, you're pretty, and you're going to get your ass there. And Linnell's like, I'm not doing it. I don't believe in the whole princess thing. It's passive. It's, you know, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. She's like, no, you're going to get there and make money. But once she's there, I had a lot of fun with her learning the job and what happens at the park and the kind of pervy dads who got kind of, you know, slip her their number, something like that. And then um, while she's there, she meets Teddy and that, and so it's a unique how we met story. Right. And so much takes the, the romance, each person's romance from the very beginning to the very end. And then again, without giving anything away, as Skyla says, in the very last minute in an unexpected twist, like a bit of magic, the couple ends up together after all. And that was, I wanted to leave the book at the very last minute. I wanted a twist that left things on a really happy and hopeful note. And so um, as crazy as it, things get in the midst of the narrative at the end, I wanted to leave it with a bit of sweetness. And I hope yes. I you oh you oh you definitely did you you definitely did because it, it it opens with a bang and not a happy bang yeah this first line everybody um every marriage has its secrets so on and so on and indeed they do and um yeah so i knew i was in for it all all, all you know already but yes it does it does have, it does end in sweetness uh, i always want the first line of a book to really be an of the invitation to pull the reader in. And mm -hmm. so like Strange But True, I think opens with a late night phone call. And then I think Helpful the Haunted opens with a late night phone call too. <laughs> you can't use late night phone calls anymore. <laughs> You've done that. <laughs> yeah. You know, when the phone rings in the middle of the night, you're like, oh, it's not good. So it ends with, it starts things with this troubling feeling. And so in this one, every marriage has its secrets instantly. Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, 
you know, you're hooked. It's here. So I'm glad. Thank you for appreciating that. Oh, yeah. And every one of us that's married stops and thinks, okay. Uh huh. <laughs> what? And so, yeah, what, what are the. <laughs> What, what are the secrets? You know, uh, and that, uh, and and that is the case with all of these marriages. The the Mar- Linnell's marriage, um, yeah. so on. Yes, absolutely. Um, then there's a hysterical part uh, where, of course, the dog sitting um, by the travel writer. So, is this based on the wonderful career of Little Miss Rudy we just met, Ruby? If people have asked me that, shows? <laughs> Rudy is the show dog in the book. Yes, big white standard over coiffed poodle like you see and i used to when i was walking ruby i would see a man around the west village of manhattan where we live um i would see him walking this very fluffed and floofed and poofed <laughs> white dog and people would just stare at this dog because it was just like so otherworldly and i had a friend um who he had a weird arrangement. He and his husband shared a show dog with a woman who showed the dog at all these shows, but they oh. had the dog some weeks she had the dog other. And he would tell me these stories like, oh, there's all these different kind of brushes and then these blocks <laughs> that you have to get the dog to stand up on. So it does <laughs> all the striking pose. And then you, you say, stand for show, stand for show. And the dog would do this thing. And I don't know anything about that. I mean, Ruby, I don't know. Just, <laughs> We like no spoiler. We don't, we, we don't show her at shows, you know. And so I found it so fascinating. But I also thought it was a metaphor because so much of the book is really about uh-huh. inner beauty versus outer beauty. And it's no coincidence. Yes. The dog's name is Pretty, and the dog is this this an animal, but an animal that's put through its paces and judged on its beauty. And she's being taken care of by a man who is so unhappy with his appearance <laughs> uh, and, you know he gets this the skin treatment where his skin is just lasered yeah uh, during the course of his the narrative for him it basically starts molting and peeling off and things and so there's a lot about beauty inner beauty outer beauty and what we fall in love with like do we fall in love with the idea of someone do we fall in love with their appearance is it yes. with these days with everything online everything's filtered and you know people just present a version of themselves so there's a a lot of the book is a kind of a a meditation on that as well absolutely Uh, this is a really great book club book frankly because there are a lot of themes and a couple i want to talk about but beauty was one of them that struck me um you know someone makes us feel beautiful and other people make us feel ugly uh, are we seeing ourselves to other people's eyes? And I thought it was, you know, uh, there's an unattractive man, um, but in the eyes of this beautiful blind woman, excuse me, in the eyes of this blind woman, he is, in, he is incredibly handsome. I mean, what is beauty? You do address that. You know, I, I, someone said, you know, Thomas always tells me I get all these great reviews and read the reviews and I always remember the bad ones. It's true, I do. But I noticed I went and looked and someone said something like, I would have liked this book, but I thought the women were all versions of the same thing. And clearly the author is so misogynistic. And I was so hurt by that because if anything, I love women so much. I grew up my house with my mom and my two sisters. I all my friends, because growing up as a gay man, I was bullied by all the boys. So all my friends were women all through school. And then I worked in a magazine for 23 years in an office full of women. And in my agents, a woman, my editor's a woman, my publicist's a woman. So, so no one ever made that comment. And I think each wow. is different. And if anything, Jeremy is a, not the best representation of a man <laughs> at all. I mean, he's a very troubled man, but I, you know, so whatever. I just think, I think like, I don't know. I think Skyla's yes. a strong character, but troubled. I think Linnell is a wonderful person with a big, big heart, but she's kind of lost her way in life as happens to all of us. And, and then, you know, and Marianne, mm-hmm. so much fun to write because she's, she just, you know, even as dark as it gets, but when she and Mar- Jeremy first connect, so ho- reconnect, it's so hopeful and there's so much love. So I don't know, each character is flawed in their own way, but I didn't, write it you know oh. yeah yes, we all are we all are I, I think the book also has a lot to say about hindsight you know hindsight is 2020 not so much says, yeah. says 
circles. <laughs> so much. You kind of talk about nostalgia and what it makes us think about uh, those relationships in the past. And I yeah. thought that's something important to say about that. Well, also during the pandemic, so many people were reconnecting with people from their past. And I'm a very nostalgic person. And like, I don't, my house looks clean until you open a closet or open a desk drawer and then it's filled with a million things like that monkey face finger. I don't even know where it came from. It's been in a drawer of mine forever. I don't even know, but I don't throw it out because it's, I've had it forever. Keys, I have old keys. I don't know what they go to. I have tons of them. As long as you don't wear them around your neck, John. <laughs> Skyla has a necklace of keys. So I, um, I just, I don't know. I think I am a nostalgic person by nature. I thought when the pandemic happened, I thought it was really notable that a lot of people's impulse was to reach out to people from their past. And so a lot of the book yes. is people who once held such a special place in our place in our heart and our minds and our daily lives who are now no longer in our lives and sort of what happens if you bring that past into the present and in this case yes. it's mostly disastrous results except yes. in one case at the very end it's actually a very good result so it's just absolutely all of that you know yeah, great, great fodder for a book club, but especially all that you have to say about social media, reality versus fake, catfishing. Um, and, and the other thing that you made us think about was that social media as a portal to the afterlife. I had not thought about that before. Well, I noticed on Facebook, I mean, first of all, people, obviously, whatever makes them feel comfortable with their grief. But I noticed the way people talk on Facebook and they're talking to the person who's passed on, you, you know, you were this, you were this to me, you were that. And if, again, if that makes them feel good, I don't judge, but I just thought it's kind of fascinating that people have that instinct because I think, well, it's, it's Facebook. It's, they're not going to get that message in the afterlife, you know? <laughs> so I, at one point, Jeremy notices his, uh, his ex, recent ex-girlfriend, Tiffany, is doing that on Facebook, talking to her uncle who's passed on. He mentions, he's yes. like, oh, he, she's doing that thing people do where she's treating Facebook like a portal to the, the beyond. Yes. Like, and so yes. people do that. Again, I just, I don't have a judgment either way. I just find it really notable because it's so personal and so personal that people do that. And they, it's heartbreaking to see when people put these messages on there because they're, they're just so upset. They're reaching for that person. So it's not right. a that people do that again again loneliness here we go again with loneliness and the things we're driven to do when we're lonely and we need that human that connection even even with the dead i yeah i agree you know during this writing of this book it was written during some sort of dark times in my own life you know our apartment where i am right now in new york city it burned down at the hands of an arsonist my dad sadly passed away in a motorcycle accident. The pandemic swept in. So I think I was thinking a lot about these sort of larger life questions of like the people we've yes. loved, our, the people we've loved in our lives, the people we love now, um, reconnecting with people who meant so much to us. Also the idea of what makes us love someone. What you said, Denise, is like how other people can make us feel loved. Like someone can somehow, the right person, can make this feel so special somehow. And what is that about? So the book questions it. And Marianne says something like, as I've gotten older, I've come to realize it's all about hormones. You just can't control who you like and who you don't. <laughs> you know, which I had once, I was a waiter for 12 years. And when I was putting myself through college and graduate school and trying to write, and I remember my boss at the restaurant said that to me. And she used to have all these, you know, bumpy relationships. And one day she just said to me, I know, honey, I just spoke in a cigarette. I've realized you get older it's so you can't control it it's hormones and she said i used to try to fight it and just realize that's the way it is so i i don't know that i believe that but i just it's yet another theory that people have of like who do we love in this world who do we connect yes. with and why you know linnell's marriage is really someone that was kind of a safety marriage her linnell's how we met story with her husband is the least interesting how we met story because it's a Yes. Marriage. She met, she says, she met him, her ATM card got stuck, her <laughs> card got stuck. She went to the bank to complain and he was the manager and he got her card. <laughs> he asked her out and they ended up getting married. 
But in comparison to all those other really colorful stories I recounted, it's telling that she has such an uninteresting one. But she says this thing that she once read, which when I was an editor at Cosmopolitan years ago, we ran this tip where if you have a boring how we met story, <laughs> all you need to do is add in Paris on the end and it makes it so much interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we met in the unemployment line in Paris. <laughs> we met at the pharmacy buying underarm deodorant in Paris. <laughs> like we just add it. Denise, it just livens it up. So she, that kind of frames one of the chapters where she says, you know, she once heard this line and, you know, and then she, <laughs> about how she met. then she goes on to talk about how she met her husband and then how she met Teddy at Disney and this, really colorful kind of funny sweet sweet story and then at the end she says it was perfect just the way it was like they're what the kiss the night they meet they're watching fireworks with disney and there's like the fake, oh, fake yes paris <laughs> at Epcot where they are he says even though it's not the real paris it doesn't matter it was perfect to her <laughs> the way it was right there in orlando under the fireworks you know I could totally picture that. Yes. And you can, pre- it's, you can pretend. So John, I want to know when you were, when you were a waiter, were you walking around like your typical writer with a little notebook in your thing? And, Oh, that's a good line. I might, that might be, I might use that in a book. When I was a waiter, I used to, well, first of all, I should say, I loved being a waiter for many, many, many years. And I made such good money. I love my customers I would save all my money. It paid for college for me. It paid for graduate. Wow. It supported me when I was trying to first trying to become a writer. And I would save my money and go backpacking for a couple of weeks in August with my girlfriend back when I had girlfriends. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, um, but I, by the end, by year 10, 11, 12, I was like, I just, just had done it too long. And um, I always tell this funny story, Denise. Um, it was like a Sunday night and I, I, I kept my restaurant job outside the city near where I went to college, undergrad. But I then moved to the city, went to movie, but I kept the job on weekends because I had good tips and, you know, good regular customers. But I'd have to, on Sunday night, take the late train back. If I, and if I missed an earlier train, I'd take a super late train. So I remember I put up all the chairs. It was snowing outside. I was ready to race to the train. And then this three people came into the restaurant and it was like five of 10. And the, my boss... <laughs> you have to seat them. And I remember I went up to the table, Denise, and I was like, what can I get you? And the woman looked at me and said, smile. And I burst into tears. <laughs> I started crying. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'll be right back. So I had kind of clearly, that was like year 12 or something. I couldn't do that anymore. But I used to go in the men's room and there were all these napkins that I would write, make notes on them. Not really so much about <laughs> chin. It was more just like a, little waiter diaries of like, this guy in table 10 just complained to steak of poivre is, is overcooked. Um, this too many, too few coupons in her Caesar salad and things like that. So, yeah. Oh, so you used it to uh, channel your strip or make notes yeah. for future books. It's like a journal. I see something on the screen from someone named Merwin about. Merwin. Um, Let's see. Yeah, we do have a question. He, uh, he wants to know. Is it true that you once read tarot cards for a living? Is that true? And does it have a place in your writing? Thanks, Merwin. Thank you, Merwin. And I'm so curious how you happen to know about my tarot card background. Um, I did not do it for a living, no, but I have two tarot card moments. When I was a kid, I used to go to library because we lived near the town library. I was really um, bullied, as I said, in the libraries. That's why it's always an honor to speak with any library. Thank you. I just libraries to me are the most magical special places in the world I always say it's like a church with books um but better than a church because I don't really love going to church sorry but uh, but, I love library. but anyway I would just pull things off the shelf and read and my grandfather uh, had he lived with us when I was really little and he had a cigar box and inside was a box of tarot cards and so I pulled them off and tried to kind of teach myself how to read them and I I didn't you know, I got so far with it, but then I had a, a wonderful, wonderful teacher professor who read tarot cards and then she taught me how. And so, yeah, there were times like as a waiter where I would, after my shift, I would read, people would, customers would come to have me read. So I'd sit at this booth at the restaurant reading people's tarot cards, reading the staff. And then when I first met Thomas, we were dating in the middle of the night, the 
phone would ring at like one in the morning and it'd be my boss at the restaurant or another waitress at the restaurant. And they would say, is, you know, can, please, can you do, do a reading for me? Is he going to leave his wife for me, please? So I'd say, hold on, I'd turn on the light, I'd throw the card and Thomas said, am I living with a fortune teller? <laughs> what? <laughs> And Thomas is very, um, this way, very Catholic. And his dad, as I said, is from Rome. His mom is from Lithuania, you know. And so Thomas does not like tarot cards or anything like that. So he oh. made early on kind of retire my tarot cards that I still have them, obviously. <laughs> but sometimes when he's out of town, they come out. But, you know, the funny thing is, I don't really believe in them so much, but I just technically know what they say and understand okay. of them. And, um, I don't know, even years later, people will still call me and say, please, will you read for me? And so oh. I take extra money doing that. Because I was, Denise, I can't tell you, I had no money. Like, my dad was a cross-country mm-hmm. truck driver. You know, like, I was the first person in my family to go to college. I paid my own way, paid my way through graduate school. I had a partial scholarship at NYU. But, you know, moving to New York was very expensive. And so oh, yeah. between waiting tables and tarot cards sometimes, <laughs> odd jobs, you know, it did what you had to do. Yeah, I did what I had to do. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And right. now you just have to write. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Beautiful thing. Well, I know that, that that some of our guests are writers. We always get a lot of, uh, of writers. Um, and so I have to ask you that question you always get asked. <laughs> Tell us about your writing process. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you, know. <laughs> you know. It always changes because, you know, for years I was a waiter. And then for years I was a magazine editor. And so... I've just always found the time, but right now I'm very blessed because my best writing is to get up early in the morning. I cut, if we're in New York city, I come downstairs. I, I have, I always write in yellow legal pads, my pencil oh. transition, transfer them into the computer. And that's the first round of editing. And we have a little house out of town uh, in Sag Harbor. And when I'm out there, same thing. I like to get up early in the morning when it's quiet. There's not a lot of emails yet. And, um, just quietly write and you know I try to read books that really inspire me and they're not always thrillers like during the pandemic I read so many short story collections so many literary novels I, you know I don't really get hung up on categorizations I just like good books so yes really, really literary not literary I don't know short stories right. novel novella whatever it is I just want a good story and and good writing and so I, I try to read books that will inspire me and um and then at some point, you know, when I first met Thomas, I always say I, I was younger. And so I would wake up from like 2 a.m. to like 5 a.m. and write and then go back to bed. And he said to me when I would publish those first books, like Voice of Missing or Change Picture, when do you write these books? I never see you write. And I say, now I don't have quite the energy to get up from 2 a.m. to 5 a.m. So <laughs> I write, I'm like, come quick, I wrote a sentence. Come look, <laughs> it, it happened. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's, you know, but it's still such a fun process. And my sister gave me a t-shirt once that said, careful, or you'll end up in my novel. And it's very much like that. Like I see, like today I posted on my Instagram and on Facebook, um, a picture where I checked, I was on book tour for Helpful the Haunted and I checked into a hotel in Alabama and there was all this noise and chaos. And I look and there are a million not million, but dozens and dozens yeah. of priests wearing their clerical collars. And I said, well, oh. on. And the woman said, oh, it's a priest convention. And then they were so boisterous and drinking. And I, I didn't know. I said, I went in and talked to them. I said, I didn't know priests could drink. They said, we're whiskey palians, whiskey palians. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I remembered that just that experience and what a fun, random surprise it was checking into a hotel. And then there was this, Paris rocking out, partying with each other. And so wow. I gave that experience to Jeremy when he goes to the hotel in Providence <laughs> with his big show dog, he checks into yes. the priest convention and there's there's priests everywhere. And, <laughs> and they say the same line to him, more whiskey pennies. And the, the like a funny moment where, he, funny to me, I don't know find it funny, but um, he said, the woman says, sorry, sir, we don't allow dogs. The woman on the counter and he says, well, what about those men over there? They're wearing collars. She's like, <laughs> Erico collars, not dogs. And like, nice like, try. Nice try, buddy. And so I oftentimes, part of my process is just paying attention to things. And I don't really keep a notebook. It's just 
kind of in my memory. And then when I sit down, okay. work, things come out, okay. you know. Okay. Because that's good. Because I thought you were going to, when you started to talk about going into the men's room, at, uh, you know, when you were a waiter, uh, a waiter, and I was thinking, oh, wow, he's, he's writing on toilet paper or <laughs> he's writing a, this great quote that I might use. It's on napkins and things that I forgot, them. I forgot about them. And then years later, I found them and they were mostly written in pencil. The pencil started to fade. So I tried tracing them. Oh. I didn't want them to fade. And a lot of them read like really kind of depressing notes about like, oh, I'm going to be 100 and waiting tables. Because like I said, I love that. Yeah, but by year 12, I kind of was ready to move on to do something else. But, you know, I always had a dream of being a writer ever since I was a little kid and I didn't know how to do it. And then, you know, I often talk about this. I have two younger sisters and one of them sadly passed away after her senior prom. And after that happened, I just, it kind of solidified my determination to to live the life I wanted to live. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to try to become a writer. I'm going to find my way to do this thing. And it took me many years and a lot of rejection. So as you said, there's a, a lot of writers who will watch. Oh, absolutely. It. And absolutely. I encourage you to keep believing in yourself, to find trusted readers. That's so important to find trusted readers who have your best interest in mind to share your work with and get thoughts from. And um, just no rejection is part of it, but to, to keep writing and putting words on the page is important. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the question that, that I want to ask about writing, um, during the pandemic and when, when we at the library were closed and, um, you know, we, I think all of us were struggling to find ways in which to, to ride that wave, you know. Uh, for me, it was keeping a nature journal and watching what was going on outside and writing letters and cards to friends to, to connect. Um, and I used to think about my writer friends, the, 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 especially the ones that we host often, Karen Slaughter, Jocelyn Jackson. And I wondered, I thought, gee, I hope that the pandemic is a blessing for them in that, you know, they have to stay put and they have to write. They have the time. And I, then I also wondered, but, but wait a minute, is this an escape and a benefit uh, and a way to reach out? Or, you know, so, so I guess what I'm asking, not doing so well, <laughs> is how was the pandemic for you? What, was it a motivation or was it a, did it hurt your career writing career? Well, we packed up our car two years ago in March and left for what we thought would be a few weeks. Because we, this oh. is getting scary. And then we thankfully had a little house out of town and we stayed there. And in the beginning, it was just surreal and strange as it was for everyone. And we kept thinking, when are we going to go back to New York? When are we going to, when are we going to go back to New York? Yes. And at the time, I really love being there. And it was actually for me, and I've talked to other writers about this. Some, it was wonderful. Others could not focus. For me, it was wonderful. I read so much. I realized how much of my time I give away. Mm. Social obligations, seeing people, which I, I'm a very social person and I love to see people in chat, but I, I realized I was doing it to such an extreme that I wasn't honoring my writing time. And the pandemic was a built-in way to honor my writing time. So every morning I got up, made a pot of coffee, read books I wanted to read, wrote wow. stories I wanted to write, worked on Her Last Affair, which I'm incredibly proud of, and worked on some stories, finished them that I'm proud of, started a new book that I'm proud of. So for me, it was a it, it was a wonderful time. And I'm, a, I'm slightly worried. I won't obviously want the world to go back to quote normal, but it worries yes. me because I like having that built in buffer. You know, some writers are better yes. doing it than me. Like Karen Slaughter, she's, I know her, she's a pal. And I know she's really good at that, of like creating her time to work and and honoring that. And sometimes I, I give away my time to people. And so I, that was a lesson, mm-hmm. you know, because I love people, that's my problem. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I hear you, but but still the pandemic taught you that important lesson. And I, you know, there's- a- Have some water, honey. I feel bad, Denise, I know. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. So tell us about your next book because we all want to know while I drink water. Um, you know, I'm not far enough into it yet to say because okay. when I write these books, I kind of, um, you know, people always say the thing, are you a pantser or a plotter? I kind of hate that question because I'm a mix of, yes. I do have a- ideas for where the plot will go but it's always changing as I write so it's kind of a combo of things so I, I don't have my sound bite yet down to explain it but okay your elevator speech I have a 
do I run into sometimes? <laughs> says, oh, I'm, honey, I'm writing the best book ever. It's a masterpiece, a masterpiece. And I think, God, I wish I had that confidence. <laughs> I'm always like, I never know if I'll be able to pull it off until the last sentence. And then when I get to the last sentence, like when I told you that very last minute twist in her last affair, that yes. twist suddenly and ends on a really sweet note. I remember when I wrote it and got there, I thought, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. I did it. So never know at the very end if I can pull it off, but you would think I've written many books by now and I would have that confidence, but I don't know always, you know, have it. And I it's saw okay. Merwin said you're I'm not fine. ready to talk about it. That is fine. I saw Merwin said something every one yes. able to Do your them. characters ever surprise you? Yeah, but first Merwin said previously, I think everyone should wait tables yes. at some point. And I, I agree. did say that so much about food like when i i remember starting the restaurant you had to put you had to work off in the kitchen as like an expediter and they would put things up they say put lemon on the fish and they would put things up and i was like is that fish i mean i didn't know anything <laughs> i knew nothing so i learned about food i learned about people because it was a really good socializing experience for me do care do your characters ever surprise you yes i know that sometimes people just say Oh, that's ridiculous. They come from you. How can you surprise? Them? But it's surprising the things that end up happening when you're writing. You you think you're going. That's what I mean about that question. Are you a pants or a plot? It's like I don't know. I have a plot in my head, but then you realize, oh, that's not working. And then you have a oh, what about this instead? And that's a surprise. So yeah, that does happen. And that, that to me is the fun of writing a book. Is when you there's a lot of frustrating aspects of writing a book. It's wonderful. <laughs> can be but the a fun part is when you stumble upon like a, a really great surprise and you know like absolutely like the surprise of having the driving move the quotes from all the films that was such a thing i hadn't planned but as i was kind of halfway through the book it came to me that and even within the narrative jeremy's a big 80s movies buff so he talks a lot about film yes films at the drive-in so there's a lot if like so, if someone really is a big movie lover I think oh yes it will be for them because there is like a, a love of cinema kind mm -hmm. of baked into the storyline so. oh absolutely there, there's a lot of great a, a lot of meat to talk about with this book this yeah. adds that the whole social media thing love yeah and so i do you know like other authors i call into book clubs and do zooms and skypes and think, so please if anyone sees this and you would like me to come or call um, and I'm happy to do it. It's fun. I, you know, I did a thing for Over the Haunted 50 Book Clubs, 50 States where I either Skype oh. or went to a book club in every state. And so it was a lot of fun to do that. Wow. Yes. We just have to remember to turn our microphone off after. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's right. It was Georgia. That's right. It was Georgia. So everyone can. It wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't me. My book club. I know. And I, whenever I tell the story, I always say <laughs> my best friends from Georgia, two of my best friends are from Georgia. I love the state of Georgia. Just these five ladies oh. from Georgia, for some reason, didn't like me very much. And then I, we did our little meeting and then I had Ruby wave because I thought they just seemed like not interested. So we hung up and for though Denise has a story for anyone who doesn't, or so we thought we hung up. They <laughs> turn off the microphone and I heard them say, do you think he's gay? He seems gay. He seems really, really gay. Well, I might actually read his book now. And Thomas said to me, please tell me you just hung up. And I said, no, are you kidding? I took notes. I wrote notes. <laughs> and then the very sweet librarian wrote me the next day to thank me. And I wrote her back. And Thomas said, please just tell me you said you're welcome. And I said, well, I'm really worried because I actually found it, Denise, so funny. I laughed about it. Of course. It didn't hurt my feelings. It makes a funny story. <laughs> Whatever. These things happen in life. But I thought, it what, if, what if there was another writer who was far more sensitive. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So I said, I wrote back to the library and I said, it's my pleasure. I'm always happy to meet new readers. I feel so honored and lucky to do it. <laughs> I said, just so you know, you didn't disconnect or they didn't disconnect the mic. Make sure for another writer who might be sensitive <laughs> to do that. And, then I said, and by the way, you can tell Maxine, I think that was her name. You can tell her I'm gay. I'm not sure what that has to do with anything, but let her know. She never wrote back. <laughs> I bet she didn't. Well, Amy, who's running the back of the house uh, tonight, runs the Atlanta Reads Book Club, and we have about 85 members. So, Amy, we need to do uh, one of John's books. Yep. 
Come preferably, please. And remember to turn the camera off. <laughs> or leave it on and say things and give me another story to tell. <laughs> she's she's classy. She would that's a mistake that we probably made a year and a half ago. <laughs> um, I, I used to love coming in on Zooms with and, and somebody wouldn't realize that people were already there and then they start. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, it's an easy you know, book, as you know, having read it, is Jeremy overhears his very first love, who he loved so much. He overhears her, her say something so heartbreaking about him that he yes. leaves town and has not seen her in 25 years. And he finally works up the courage to contact her again because he cared about her so much, but he's haunted by this memory of something so, someone said about him. So, my whole life, there have been many, many times that George just club story is just a funny one to me I didn't, whatever it but is the, very like, fun. it's like a funny story Thomas and I had this couple to dinner it was a snowy winter night we made we had a fire we have a fireplace in our apartment we had a fire and we made he made like lamb shank or something and then at the end of the night one of them forgot their sweater and I said to Thomas oh, they're in the elevator I'll run it down the stairwell and meet them in the lobby and just as I got down the stairwell I was about to round the corner seven to the lobby and I stepped off the elevator and I heard them say, oh, they serve some <laughs> heavy food <And> John, <laughs> so fast. They serve such heavy food and John eats so fast. And I, it's like I froze and I came <laughs> up, they never got their sweater back. But, um, <laughs> you know, there've been so many times in my life where it's happened to all of us. We overhear oh. something, something about you. Yes. And it's funny, like the two stories I just told, but then sometimes it's really heartbreaking and awful. And so Absolutely. I wanted to write about that experience in the book. And so Jeremy had that experience of those Ruby uh, with his first love and it really affected his life. And, and so, it's it come, what she said that night comes out in the middle of this dark moment Absolutely. between them, this horrific thing that she said that he overheard. So um, it was an interesting puzzle piece to put together in that way. Absolutely. Well, I think, I think um, your doggy is saying, come on, dad, that's enough already. But John, this was an absolute delight. You are a delight. And I please, oh, please, please, when you uh, finish that next book, please come to Georgia again. Visit your friends in commerce and your friends at Gwinnett County Public Library. I would love nothing more than to come down to Gwinnett okay. Library, to come to commerce, as I said. I was telling you yes. before we started, my best friend grew up in commerce, Georgia. And I, in Strange But True, I made one of the characters. That's where he grew up before it was the land of discount stores and outlets. And it was just a little random town in Georgia and more, it's where my best friend grew up. And I used to come down to Roswell because my other best friend moved there in eighth grade. He broke my heart by moving away. But my dad was a cross country truck driver and often passed through Georgia on his way to bring things places. And so he would drop me off at Georgia to visit my best friend. And so I have so many fond memories of Georgia and coming to the Georgia uh, book What's it called? The Georgia Book Center, right? With Chris Bojillian. Georgia Center yeah. for the Book. Center for the Book. Yeah. Chris Bojillian. So I would love to come back, Denise, and come to the library and Please. see you in person. And, and uh, everyone have a lovely evening. And John, take good care. It was you. wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night.